And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? <clears throat> the goodness of God does not always leave man when he steps out of God's way. Indeed, it might do so. And when we depart from God, God might say, Now go, good providence, and leave them. But what does this goodness of God? It stays and bides until it brings some folk back again to God. And then when they are returned, the more that the goodness of God has been with them, it makes them the more to mourn when they return again. We have an instance of this in this chapter. We have here a king, a good king, and he has gone out of God's way. And yet God's goodness has not left him. But it stayed even after his sinful accession in association with Ahab. It said he returned in peace to his house, uh, to Jerusalem. Now in this chapter there are several things spoken of him. For this chapter speaks not only of his fall and sets out all his goodness, but it speaks first of his deliverance. And then of the rest. First, he came to his house at Jerusalem in peace. Secondly, it speaks of the sharp reproof he meets with from the prophet upon the very entry. Anybody would have thought that they should have gone and met their king with praise and flattery. Nay, but the prophet of God goes to meet him with a sharp rebuke. Sharp rebukes were meetest for him, meter than any other thing, even the best of them all. But here the Holy Ghost marks the sharp rebuke he got, he got from the prophet. We hear nothing of what return he gave to the prophet, but he took with it. It is a rare thing to see a, a mean person to take with a reproof from a prophet, but much more to see a king acknowledge and say, indeed, I am guilty. I say it's a rare thing to see a mean person to take with a reproof. But here a king takes with a rebuke. Those that stand out against God's reproof, God will give over to reprove them until the day of judgment. And then the libel will be altogether put in their hand and see who will refuse then. But here... He takes a reproof sweetly from God. Oh, bless him that he is wearing a reproof upon you, and bid him now tell on, and say, what more has he now to reprove me of? Oh, the heart of man is so proud that it will not take with conviction and reproof. We say it again, the heart of man is so proud that it will not take with conviction and the reproof of God without humbling grace. But thirdly, the third thing shown of him is this. He takes with his reproof, and that is a token of it, for he goes on to the work of God, notwithstanding of the prophets reproving of him. He goes on, I say, to the work of reformation. We shall say this generally, wherever there is and association with wicked men, they will forget reformation until association be broken again. Here he forgets reformation until the association with Ahab be broken. And then he goes on to reformation. We shall say that one word. Our sinful association with the malignant party in Scotland not only has made us forget the work of reformation, but has shut the door altogether that none should go forward in a national reformation. And till this association be quit, ministers nor people will never set forward in reformation again. Would you know when the reformation began to be at a stand or stay? 
It was that day when we took the malignant party by the hand, and it has stood all this time. Until that be quit, quit again, it will never be set forward. And when it is quit, it will set forward, and that by every one of you in your several places and stations. And then it will be said that of them that did most withstand is now removed out of the way and made to fly away. And then you shall see nothing but reformation going on. Oh, if it were to come to that. But fourthly, there is the reformation itself, which is set out in these three. First, it is set out in the body of the land, the generality or the body of the land. What does he t to them? Verse 4, he went through the people and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. They were like runaway servants. Yea, not only so, but like the Levite's concubine that had departed from her husband and had played the whore. And so he brings them back again to the Lord. But now you see what is the duty or office of a king to bring back the people of God to God. What has the king done and these rulers? Their exercise in these kingdoms has been to debauch folk from their obedience to God. And in a word, it has been to exoderate that authority of God and introduce and heighten man's authority. And has not that been that which all of them have been carrying on? Let the commands of men be great with you. And the commands of God be small. This they have employed themselves all into. But never a word of the commands of God nor his authority. But I say this is the work and matter he employs himself into. He goeth through Judah and he bringeth the people back again to God. Like runaway servants or the Levite's concubine. They had been away. But now his holy king this holy king, he employs all his power to bring them back again to God. And he thinks them good subjects, if they be good saints. But what is obedience to him in regard of obedience to God? But the contrary is said and done by the men of this generation. We are sure we see this plain from the scripture, or word of God, that this is a part of the office of a king. And he that hath no regard to this ought no more to be esteemed a king, but a tyrant and an en enemy to God. But secondly, a second part of reformation is done upon the civil state. What doeth he there? He sets judges in every city of Judah, etc. We will get customers anew in all the cities of Judah, but few judges more for exactions and customs, nor for, not for judgment. Now, undoubtedly, as he was a holy man himself, so he set holy and good judges in every city. For every king will choose out such judges as himself is. Officers and judges will tell you what a nature of the kings, what a nature the kings are of. <clears throat> Soldiers and curates shows what the disposition of their princes is. Then we may know what is the nature of the king and court. A holy king will have holy judges that will give justice and equity to all. But now we need not look for equity and justice if they would let us alone with their injuries. Now I say that is the second part of reformation. That is in the civil or state. He gives holy judges and he has a particular exhortation to them when he puts them in their office in verse 6. And it is remarkable that he says to them in the entry of their office, <clears throat> anybody would have thought that he would have said, see well to my prerogatives and privileges. Let not them be wronged. Let not the royal rents be decreased. See that the crown rights be no way di di uh, diminished. These and the like uh, ordinarily kings recommend at, their, at first. But what says he? He said to the judges, take heed 
what ye do. For ye judge not for men, but for God the Lord, who is with you in judgment. Remember this. I commit judgment to you, but the judgment is not mine. It is the Lord's. And remember what you do. It is for God. Then do it as if God himself would do it. Do it as if he were sitting there. Now, where is there any judges that do this way? Where is there a king that desires them to do so? Or to do this way? Kings say now, ye man, judge for me. Ye have your office with me, and therefore judge for me. But says he, I give you authority of judging, but remember, ye must answer to God for your judgment. For God is with you in judgment. That is to say, he is present with you to help you if you do right, and to be displeased with you if you judge wrong. He is present to protect you if you do right, but to be a witness and to punish you if you do wrong. That's the thing he commands unto them. Now I have given you power and set you in a capacity to judge matters rightly. Then see ye well to it, for the judgment is not mine, but the Lord's. And if ye judge rightly, God will be with you in it. God, he will preserve you and protect you. But if otherwise, no. But there is one word in the exhortation before we proceed to the third thing. Wherefore, let the fear of God be on you, for there is no respect of persons with God. Oh, but this were necessary if every king, when he puts a judge upon the bench, would give him such an exhortation as this when he sits down, saying, Take heed to yourselves, let the fear of God be upon you. It is even but in vain to speak to men if there be not something of the fear of God on them to make them do rightly and well. So if there be a principle of the fear of God in them, then an exhortation may be useful and profitable. But let the fear of the Lord prevail. And if that make you not do right, it will not be all the exhortations of men will do it otherwise. Or if that be not, you will slip ever more when you have the opportunity and you will never be a seeker in good. But now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, for there is no iniquity in God. He will do no iniquity himself, and the unjust counsel he will not allow of. So this is one thing that everyone would remember and look to. There is no iniquity in our in our God, and you need not think that when you do wrong in judgment that he will allow of it. For all processes and judgments that have been given out by men will be seen by God in the long run. For he is like a great king that must survey everything. It's true. Our, it's true kings now never look to the judgments that inferior officers do if they be according to law. So then he says to them, see to it, God will be with you in judgment. It will be seen by God how ye have judged, and according to the judgment that he that ye have given, God will give you judgment. Now, God is no acceptor of persons. What is that? Give everyone his due, for God will give everyone his due. Think you God will spare a king more than a beggar? No. For all are his creatures. He hath set up a king there. Therefore, kings are more bound to him than others. Said Christ, who ought to love most? It was answered he to whom God has given the most. So he that has gotten most tokens of God's love, he should be most holy. And they to whom less has been given, less is expected of. And so they should be most holy who command others. For with God there is no respect of persons, and so there ought to be no respect of persons with judges. Folk think that kings are above laws. But let any man show us that kings are above laws, either from scripture or reason. 
God hath said it that with him there is no respect of persons. So this will bring a king in under the law as well as others. Then he who judges for God must say that he, if he say rightly, even this with us, there ought to be no respect of persons. Indeed, we will add this one word, which is necessary to be added in this case. There is no buddy that rules, but they will be liable to failings in ruling. And therefore, if all faults of rulers should be exactly looked to, there would be none who would rule a day to an end. But we might find faults in them for which to depose them ere night. But we will say this, it is one thing to be a failing in infirmity and another thing to be in a constant course of wickedness and enmity against God. The first may be spared, but not the last. Then look where we are now. But whatever you think of this, it is the truth of God which we are declaring unto you at this time. The thirdly, the third thing in the Reformation is regarding the priesthood, so that in effect he takes up the whole land, first the body of the people, second the state or civil magistrate, and third the priesthood or the ministry. And so a perfect reformation should go on through the three altogether. Let everyone bring it to his own heart. Kings and rulers must reform without in the land, under or in a time of reformation. But will you not reform yourselves? Verse 8. He appointed Levites and priests in every city, and the chief of the fathers for the judgment of the Lord, and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 9. He charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. This was the great judicatory that they had in the land. It was made up with priests, and lawmen. There was some priests in it and some civil men, and they judged together in the Lord's matters. The matters of the Lord belonged to them, that is, the priests, and the king's matters belonged to the others. But all was to judge according to the word of God. We shall say this one word more. There is one great thing folks stumble at in that in that paper, that kings ought to rule or judge according to the judicial law, and that these laws kings ought to rule by ought to be according to the word of God. And think ye this a great wrong? The people of God were ruled 200 years and upwards by this law only, and can any be fitter to be a lawgiver than God? Have we laws? Have we them from men or of God? If of men... Then they had them of God. Then the God of nature or the God that created all is far better to teach laws than man that is under God. We say stumble not that it is said the laws of God ought to be the laws of the land, for it will never be well with you, especially the the mean of the land, until the laws of God be the laws of the land. Then we will not be counted with great ones to oppress for when they have laws to make they never do a thing but oppress the poor but when the law of God speaks it will give right to the poor as well as to the great so the law of God should be our law where the law of God is received where Christians are let Christians go to the law which God has found out and let the heathens and Turks go to the law that nature finds out. Now, they judge in the matters of the Lord and in controversies. For understanding this better, there was a great court at Jerusalem, and all the difficult matters came there. There were courts and judicatories through the land, and there uh, were judges of hundreds and other officers and judges of thousands throughout the land, but all hard matters they brought to Jerusalem. And now he sets judges to receive these hard matters that they could not judge among themselves and they gave judgment in these matters. Now the last thing, and we will not go to speak anymore, is the charge he gives them. 
verse 9, and he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord. There is great necessity to be earnest with them that kings commit judgment to, that they be faithful. There is much need for it now, for if kings' laws be seen to, there will be little regard what come of the laws of God. We know this by experience. All the supplications of this poor land have been rejected, and the laws of men well seen to. We thought to begin to speak to all these particularly, but first a word of of his delivery. He comes in peace to his house. Why does the Holy Ghost mark this? If you observe the chapter before, he was in a dangerous battle where he had a sore assault. They set upon him for the king of Israel, and the Lord delivered him out of that. And so the Holy Ghost marks this. He came home in peace. And the Holy Ghost will have us to mark this of it, that notwithstanding of this sinful plight he was in, in associating with Ahab, yet God graciously brought him off. He associated with Ahab, and God might have let him fall with him. Yet Ahab fell, and he is safe. The battle is lost, and he returns in peace. We shall say this one word. Whoever hath gotten such special deliverances from God, especially when under slips, they may, they would consider narrowly in their hearts what they have been doing. Wherefore, they have met with such deliverances. But ye will say to us, we were not in a sinful association. We were not associated with sinful, wicked, and profane men. But we shall say this one word, we were associate in a sinful union. And so there was a sinful association with an evil course. Now that many fell, was it not just and a holy dealing in God that some were preserved in such a fall as that? Oh, consider well wherefore it was that God has so remarkably preserved you, especially when he might have taken away your life. Now there are several here that have had a part of such deliverance as this, not only once, but once and again, Oh, great deliverances has he given to some, even uh, when they were associated with a sinful cause and sinful cause. Then mind now and remember wherefore it is that God has preserved you. It is to repent of sin. Yet more, it is that you may be ready at a good turn again when he calls for it at your hands. But beware of this. Though he let you go in a sinful uh, action once, beware of the next time by no more joining in sinful associations. For sinful associations are ever dangerous. Whatever the ungodly meet with in them, yet certainly the godly never thrives in such associations. Now this is the thing that we would say. Let every man that has a part in such remarkable deliverances say, Wherefore hast thou preserved me? Wherefore is it that I have life? Is it a blessing? But I think not so much of it as I should, that I have it so wonderfully. Is it not for some end, even that I may employ it some way for God's glory? Go back and ask, Wherefore is it so remarkable He gave you your life when in danger and while you were in a backsliding course and while you were associated in a sinful way and when you were involved in a course with the deadly and destroying enemies. Consider this, therefore, wherefore has God given you this life? Say, wherefore hast thou preserved this life? Is it that I may be for thee and employ it for thee? The next thing to be considered is the prophet's reproof. He is a misheard prophet. Would anybody think that he should speak so to a king? Aye, but we must be faithful in reproving kings as well as others. Modesty is ruin here. Modesty in such a case is ruin to the rulers. For if we had gone and told them their sins, 
that they had not gone on in such a course as they did. Silence or modesty here is not a virtue but a vice. It is, it is but unfaithfulness to God and man. Might he not have let them come home? Nay. Why? Will he make him sad? Why will he make him sadder and sadder? Why are you sad? If it be affliction that you are sad for, you must not be so. That is not the thing you ought to be sad for. There is sin you must be sad for. So you would think folk should be spared that is in affliction. Nay, but spare them not. For then they will be, uh, they will best hear reproofs when under affliction, never better than then. Now the thing he says to him is this. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? How fit is this to be applied to our times? See hence, whoever helps the ungodly is in the fault. They now talk good men are upon both parties. Whom shall we condemn or follow? We shall say this one word, be they good or evil, if they love them that hate the Lord and help the ungodly, they are to be reproved. See who does such are on the wrong side and to be reproved. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should ye help him higher for all the little good that they have done with their power? which they have gotten already. They have too much of it already. Oh, that all the ungodly in the world were many steps lower than they are. What will they do when ye have set them up? They will set up wickedness with it. Oh, help God and the godly, but beware to help the ungodly. They are high enough already, and there is none who will help to raise or hold them up But God will reprove them, for they can do nothing when they are raised up but wickedness. This scripture speaks plainly. Shouldest thou help the ungodly? We shall say no more of it but this. Whoever has helped the ungodly at this time are worthy of a a reproof. We are in two parties now. There is one party, the Lord and the godly, and the other party, the ungodly. See what party ye will take now. Shouldest thou love them that hate the Lord and help the ungodly? Be what he will to you, Jehoshaphat was joined in affinity with Ahab, and so came of it. But ye, ye, be ye who he will, but be who he will, father or mother or your king. Should ye love and help him that hates the Lord? We shall only say this word and take heed to it, for it is the word of truth. Enmity and hatred against God cuts off all obligation. Indeed, we will say that though we were in the nearest obligation, that is to say, even in that relation betwixt a father and a son, yet in this case it is cut off. The Holy Ghost says that his father and mother shall thrust him through while he is prophesying. We say this then, that the hatred of God takes away all near and far off obligation. For if they go on to hate the Lord and to blaspheme the name of God affrontedly and oppose the truths of God and with malice and hostility oppress the work of God, we may not help and join with them. If any man can give a better doctrine than this, he may, but he cannot. But remember, he brings it not from the scriptures of God if he give you that which is contrary to this. But we shall leave it. Amen.